Tune into this week's Xamarin Show where my good friend Jeffrey tries to convince me that I should be lifting my state even higher using some awesome libraries. So tune in. Welcome back everyone to the Xamarin Show. I'm your host James Montemagno and today I have my very good friend, as you may have seen on Twitter, Jeffrey coming in. How's it going, Jeffrey? Thank you, James. Yes. Um, thank you for having me here today. I'm very um, excited. It took maybe a year and a half to get you here, but it finally happened. It finally happened. Yes. Um, I'm so glad to, to, to come here today. Um, I would like to talk about some and share something that's very close to my heart, and that's a uh, program using the reactive extensions. And I'd like to share with you why it's so compelling and uh, how you can use it to simplify uh, your code base. Yes, and what has happened here is essentially Jeffrey looks at all my applications and he goes, I think I could make that better. I think I can make it cleaner. And I go, my code's really readable and it's very out of the box. And something that we have a lot on the Xamarin show are these great, amazing libraries that help not only sometimes architecture application in different ways, but also I think what's really interesting about reactive extensions and reactive UI is that it is not just a Xamarin thing, it's not just a C-sharp thing. Yeah. These things are kind of everywhere. And uh, if there was one person that I wanted to have on to talk about it, it, it was you, so I'm really excited. So before we jump into it, maybe tell everyone a little bit about yourself and your work in, in, in the Rx space. Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Jeff Huntley. Uh, I got involved with Xamarin as, as, ever since 2013, and I've been very active in the open source community. I took over a lot of creations created by Paul Betts. Um, and Paul Betts was very, very um, excited about reactive extensions, and he kind of became my mentor, and I just took over after him. And um, reactive extensions is super compelling um, in the sense that it was invented uh, 13 years ago. It's been around for a long, long time. It's been around for a very long yeah. time. It was actually a Microsoft invention, mm. and it's a paradigm. It's a way of thinking about your code. It, it's, it's completely different. but. With reactive extensions, it does take a bit of time to learn a new paradigm. Yeah. But this paradigm is universal. Got it. Right. It is for all platforms. So if I was a Java developer or a Swift developer, are, are, are there libraries that are equivalent, I, I guess? Yep. Over there. So there's like a Java React, is it called React or React Rx or what, what's the actual yeah, name? Yeah. So, um, Actually, interesting enough, when you're doing mobile development mm -hmm. in Android, it's now the default. It's now the default. So if you're going yeah. like doing interviewing, they're going to ask, How, "What do you know about Rx Java?" Oh, Rx Java. Okay, got yeah, it. Yeah, Rx Java, and likewise, there's uh, Rx Swift, there's Rx Ruby. For all the languages you could possibly imagine, there is a reactive implementation. So this is universal knowledge. Got it. So it's kind of like when. I think of, oh, we architect, there's kind of an MVC type of way, an MVVM type of way, how you're putting your code together, or maybe I'm you know, ar architecting a certain way, this kind of nice Rx model that you want to talk about. Yeah. You could be going, uh, coming over from Java, but if you know this, there is a library that will give you that paradigm. Correct. Over in the Xamarin world. Yeah. And all of everything in C Sharp, any the WPF, I assume, WinForms, yeah, yeah, this, anything. This is, this is not just about desktop or mobile applications. Mm. So reactive extensions is used heavily on the back end for reactive stream processing. Got it, okay. And it's, it's used on the web. If you create a brand new Angular project, you are creating uh, a project using RxJS. Oh, okay. And Angular 2, it's now mandatory to know RxJS. Ah. So this is uh, universal knowledge in the sense once you learn it, you can cross over between these par uh, this paradigm between different languages, and it's mm -hmm. like unit testing. Once Got you it. know it, you just know it for life. Now, is there any crossover between like React itself, like on the web, and reactive extensions? Are actually those are they the same thing? Are they different? I mean, I'm not a web developer, yeah. so I literally don't know. Uh, but I know that when I go and create a new ASP.NET, there's an option to do that. So that's my. I'm glad you asked that question, and um, I'm a consultant, and I often implement. Uh, uh, solutions in technologies, like in different technologies all the time. And I'm currently doing a React project. Okay. And I, at the same time, also maintaining the reactive extensions. So from that experience, so this is the common, uh, this is the common thing that people get confused is uh, there's the reactive extensions and there's React. Mm. Two different things. Reactive extensions is about the paradigm of going from a push-based model to a pull-based model in your code base. Okay, got it. And where React is more about uh, the reactivity of mm. things happen automatically. Got it. And 
what's really important there in React is they managed to separate their, uh, the UI from state. Okay, got it. So it's like a whole separation piece, got it. Yeah. Well, so let's jump into it then and learn a little bit about uh, reactive extensions and reactive UI. And I know that uh, we went through this earlier because I'm uh, like, like probably a lot of our viewers may be really new to this concept. Yep. So I know you didn't want to just jump into like, here's this amazing crazy demo, you know, and, and actually describe why you want to use it, what your code may look like today, and how we can kind of clean it up a little bit with uh, the, the new paradigm. So I'm, I'm excited. Let's do it. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first thing I'd like to show is um, I encourage everyone, please go out and read this academic paper. It's called Out of the Tar Pit. Okay. So there's this uh, paradigm called functional reactive programming. And this paper talks about uh, the problems we have, the real problems we have with writing applications is state. Mm, yeah. It's the real thing that needs to be solved. And something Reactive UI does, it provides a way to handle state in a single place, and it's very composable um, using the Reactive extensions. Likewise, React is also following this paper, their roadmap, they're going to be taking the entire community along the teachings of this paper. And what, what they do is they provide an imperative API without the reactive extensions. Got it. So they've got the same outcome in this paper, but two different ways of doing it. And that's, it doesn't really matter if you're using reactive extensions or React, as long as you're separating your state away and handling your state correctly. That's the most important thing. And probably the easiest example of reactivity would be uh, before we had data bindings, we used to do uh, label.txt mm -hmm. and we used to set that manually. And then, yeah. we, then we got uh, MVVM with data bindings and then we got reactivity. Yeah, we kind of pulled it up, we pulled it out. We Correct. lifted the state as we may call it. Yeah, out. we lifted the state. But uh, right now, that's where the, the, that's where the current level of fort is, is just data binding. Got it. But the world's kind of moved on in fort that we can do a lot more than data binding. Makes sense, I'm actually really, um, uh, a lot of our, our reviews may know I do a podcast with Frank Krueger, who's a big F-sharp developer. And on our, one of our most recent episodes, we talked a lot about functional reactive programming because that's what Frank uses. We talked a lot about lifting the state even higher. We talked about those paradigms, and there's a lot of web frameworks like yep. re, uh, Redux and a few other things like that are attempting to bring uh, those states up, which I think is really compelling as we see uh, a large shift of how we can uh, architect our apps in different ways. So um, I'm really interested in about it, and I know that you had uh, some really cool samples of maybe what my applications may look like today and how we can change those. Yeah, sure. So yeah. <laughs> I, I've, I've, I've grabbed an application from GitHub, mm -hmm. and the reason I grabbed this application uh, from GitHub because it mirrors the code I see in at my clients. Yeah. And they always have this problem. And um, it's, they're, mutating, uh, they're mutating state. They're essentially telling the computer how to do its job. Yes. So here we're getting some feedback. I'm telling it that right now it is busy. I'm telling it to clear a list. I'm telling it to go get the feedback. I'm telling it how to add those feedbacks to the list. I'm telling it how to sort. And I'm also telling it when it's done and also when to, um, to show an alert dialog. Correct. Right. So the, the, I mean, there's, yeah. there's multiple concerns here in a single yeah. command. So this command is meant to be fetch a feedback from a service. Mm -hmm. But what's happening here is that has a side effect of enabling the loading indicator. Mm -hmm. It has some logic related to if it fails, mm -hmm. to showing an error dialog. And we also have some logic here for modifying the collection. Yeah. And as this code is currently implemented, uh, every time feedbacks, the collection of feedbacks is done, that's an observable collection. Got and it. that's going to raise an I notify property change, and that's a screen redraw. Yeah. So if that came back with feedback of one or two, you're fine. But if it came back with a thousand, bad news. Very bad news. Yeah. Every time you do dot add in a tight loop, it's going to cause performance issues. Yes. The biggest complaint of observable collection most likely is the yeah. uh, only add. So I have some. A lot of people then do customized ones, and are those optimized? Right. So it's yeah. tricky. So how can so what else is wrong in here? I mean, I know that we kind of step through them perhaps of of each section. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll step through each each one of the, the sections. But the main thing is the the, the source of truth isn't mm -hmm. defined in a singular place. Okay. That's oh, probably the, that's probably the main the main thing is um, is busy is in an I command, right? It's in the fetch feedback command. And most applications have lots of other different commands. Mm -hmm. So what we get is is busy is if is busy or setting bu is busy true and false continually. 
what you get is race conditions in your application. You may have multiple commands, yeah. maybe other multiple threads calling it, and now is it, who's real busy? Is, is this thing busy? Now do I have to create a new is busy? It gets yep. a little complicated. I see what you're saying. Got it. So here is a, uh, a, a mocked example of mm -hmm. this. So we've got a load, and the load uh, sets is busy true and then is busy false. Very, yep. very, very common. And then we uh, introduce a, another I command, the save. Yeah. We now have a race condition in our application. And if this is asynchronous and executing asynchronous task, you will run into, uh, run into multi-threading issues. Yeah, you're really essentially assuming that the UI you have to be real specific that they will never overlap at all and that some something else may randomly happen. Right? Yeah, and a, people spend a lot of time in their debugger, mm -hmm. like so, uh, resolving state, and this is why React and the other ecosystems, that uh, people are fl uh, like loving what they're seeing, is because they provide batteries by default mm -hmm. that solves this problem. Got it. And the ecosystem by default is working on this problem. Um, and it's not really a discussion of like dependency inversion containers and all the rest. It's focused on the real problem, which is state. I see what you're saying. Got it. Okay. So um, instead of uh, instead of like telling the computer how to do its job, why don't we be a little bit more like Microsoft Excel? So here we've got an Excel sp uh, spreadsheet, and if I uh, put in the logic in column C and of summing A and B, any time A or B changes, C reactively updates. Yeah, so normally you could say uh, C equals 42 plus 7, and then it's going to work, but we can clearly see this example is using a function essentially to yep. say, when A and B change, use those values, whatever they happen to be, to update. Very simplistic, but yeah. in state that makes a lot of sense. Is Anyone that's used Excel, probably quite a few of us watching, uh, happens to be a lot of my job, uh, very used to this model. And these things can get complex, too. It's not as just simple yeah. logic. It could be uh, also change the color of this thing, do this other thing, right? all sorts of things. Yeah, so this, this example might seem contrived, yeah. but reactive, or react, uh, reactive programming and reactive extensions is all built, built on this one concept. And this one concept is throughout your code base. And if you solve it once, and you just keep doing it again and again and again, and, and the code gets simpler. So what this does is the computer is pumping the loop automatically. It's detecting when A and B does and update C automatically. It's not doing a it's not doing a C equals A plus B, yeah. and the user has on key up key down having to cause that C to update and mutate. Got it. Very very important. Well, let's look at that code base. How you would implement it in a reactive fashion using the reactive extensions. So this is going to be the same exact view model, but using reactive extensions. Correct. OK, cool. So I'm using reactive UI here. And reactive UI is a very, very small set of extensions okay. on reactive programming. So the learning reactive programming, it is an effort to learn it. But reactive UI itself is just extension methods that you would have naturally wrote yourself. OK, got it. So the core of it here is, you have reactive extension, and reactive UI adds this kind of nice little layer yep. on top with a bunch of helpers. Since we are dealing with user interface in general, so I'm imagining if you're writing server code, you probably don't have reactive UI. We do have people using oh, reactive okay. UI. Because they're so helpful, I Because some of these extension methods are so helpful. But okay. yeah, you, you typically don't. But we have a net core target, and yeah. there's a uh, there is a finance company using it on server side yeah, because I mean, of extension yeah. methods. It makes sense. Okay, got it. All cool. right, so let's talk through this code base. I still see is busy. I see a show alert. I see things that look very similar, but then I see some things that are different in here. I see a reactive list. I see a reactive command. So mm -hmm. those are new. It looks similar but different. Yeah, similar but different. Mm -hmm. So let's just quickly talk through the how the state has been separated. Okay. And then we'll look at the types. So in, in the previous code example, what we had was we had a, an I command. And within that I command, it was mutating the state of the loading indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also uh, mutating the state for whether you should show the error dialog. And it was also uh, doing what it, the command was meant to do, which is add stuff to the collection. Okay. So what we've done here is we've separated these concerns into separate areas. Mm. Right? On uh, line... Uh, line 15, what we've done is we've, we have this uh, extension method, reactive extension called when any. Okay. 
And what this is doing is, is it, just like Microsoft Excel, saying any time the command on line 13, the refresh feedback command, is executing, I'm going to assign the property to is busy. And then you have a data mm -hmm. bind to that, and it shows user interface. Okay. So what happens is on line 15, as you add more commands, you just chain the when any. You just you just keep listening to the other I commands, and you, that just grows, and that becomes the singular place in your entire application that defines when the loading indicator should be shown. I see. So you can say when any, but then you could also say when any is executing, and when first name is true, and or first name is James. And when I have when any condition. When I have network activity. Uh, when I'm doing a network request. Yeah. And so you just do select many. You just combine uh, combine these events down. Okay. And this is all happening in the constructor. Yes, yeah. See, there's, it's really lightweight, essentially. And this is the first sort of thing stuff. people get used to. It's just very different in use. You, you declare, it's, you're working in a declarative fashion, and it's all in the constructor. I see, got it. Yeah, and then what we're seeing here is that there's this still a command, and then it's going to essentially fetch async. So it's still using that same code. Yeah. I didn't actually like, have to change my a lot of my business logic. I'm kind of moving a few pieces around, but I'm still using my service and I'm still fetching that. I'm just fetching it in a different way, essentially, and then listening for it. Is that, is that the key? Is, is the top level here, this refresh feedback, below I'm just listening for when things happen? Is that the idea? Yeah. Okay. So um, one thing with this is uh, Reactive UI is with the extension methods for reactive programming. Um, that's kind of all we do. So you can use this with any other framework or library. Mm -hmm. You can intermix. And when you're first getting into reactive programming, I recommend you just do reactive view models. Mm. You do your business logic in a reactive fashion. I see. You still keep everything asynchronous, all your services, until it makes sense and you become comfortable using Observable. And then you can go full reactive. Okay. So a asynchronous is a single value returned. So uh, you do a method call, you get a single value back asynchronously. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. And reactive command returns what's called an observable. Mm -hmm. And this is the original pattern from the Gang of Four. Um, there's plenty of information out there that explains how reactive extensions work and how observables work. And the main thing about, about them is it can turn multiple values over time. Oh, okay. So this is why we're in the, in the constructor. Uh, it's yeah. why we're working in the constructor. We're declaratively uh, defined how this should behave. And uh, this command is essentially just saying, I have an I command. When this I command is executing, I'm going to do a async using async await network request. Mm -hmm. And that's all it does. That's it. That's it. That's what it's supposed to do. That's all it does. Yeah. But there's something about reactive command, the type. What it mm -hmm. does, it gives you certain guarantees about varying the results uh, back from the background thread to the UI thread for you automatically. Mm. It also gives you guarantees that only uh, one operation can be running at the same time. So if this I command was data bound to a low data and the user tapped on it lots of times really fast, they're all ignored. Got it. Yeah. It's guaranteed. So even if you forget to disable the button, it's okay if they jammed on it. It's going to guarantee that yeah. it's happening once. And uh, on line 15, there's a is executing. That itself is an observable. Oh, okay. And we're using that to determine when we should show the loading indicator or not. But you can data bind to that. Oh, I see. And you can data bind whether the command is enabled or disabled mm. straight off that property. Cool. So it's, it's really, really cool. And um, in the previous code, we saw that there was two conditions. There was a happy path and a failure path. Yeah, yeah. Often, almost almost any time that you're making any network request, right? It's either going to return the data, the big JSON yep. blob, or it's going to throw an exception because you're offline or that server isn't yep. available. Yeah. So yeah. So what we got on 18 is we've defined a happy path and a failure path. Mm. So really, now our separation is not only when that thing is executing, but it's the different paths that our code can take. Correct. Oh, cool. And it's all defined in, in a singular place where mm -hmm. you can actually start composing this very much with when any value on any on any observable, you can do when any value on that and start composing using these these outcomes to compose another outcome. Oh, cool. So it, it, it cascades. So on line 19, there's something a little bit different. Um, we're using a reactive list, not an observable collection. And 
A zobable collection has the naming of zobable, yes. but it's not a zobable in the sense of the Gang of Four pattern. Yeah, yeah. It, it literally just has a property change notifications and a, a collection change notifications yeah. built in. And it's a really yeah. good primitive, except if you're doing a large amount of updates to a, a parent object and you're yeah. updating the child. In this case, the child is adding feedback. Mm -hmm. And what Reactive List does is it exposes observables very similar to is executing that allow me to detect when a change is about to happen, when it has happened, and after it happens. Uh -huh. And we supply an extension method called suppress change notifications. And that's what it is on line 19. Why it's in that scope, that using block, it, all the change notifications are suppressed. Oh, okay. So no matter if it's one feedback retrieved from the service uh, or a thousand or a hundred yeah. thousand, it's only one screen redraw. I see. So even if I wasn't adding range here and I was just adding one at a time, it's going to suppress whatever I'm Correct. doing. Correct. That makes sense. Cool. So that's really, really cool. Um, then and on the bottom, I'm able to also subscribe to. Is, is this thrown exception then also a special kind of extension thing they have? In yeah. It? So uh, the thrown exceptions is a, another observable hmm. from the command. So I can assume you know, anytime I see subscribe, that's kind of like a li I'm listening. Listening to. AKA I'm sub I am, it's an observable. Yeah. An observable can be listened to via subs subscription. Correct. It's like Netflix. You can only watch it when you have a subscription. Yeah. And because Netflix is observable. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think nowadays we almost have to say, to what can we map our coding paradigm to in terms of Netflix? Yeah. There we go. So the. the um... <laughs> it's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> The main, the main thing here is just, just lifting the concerns yeah. up. And you can do this using F Sharp as well, very yeah. easily. Um, and, and did I have to change the user interface at all here? Is there any changes to the XAML or anything like that? No. And if, and if I wasn't using XAML forms, it would work still if I was using an MVVM architecture, I guess, as well. Yeah. yeah. No change to XAML. Mm -hmm. um, this, this concept, uh, Reactive UI, is used in Atlassian source tree. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's used in Visual Studio, mm. Slack, uh, and also, um, so Slack. Do, 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 do. Oh, it's places. also used in Amazon Drive. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. It's in Amazon Got it. Drive. Got it. So a whole bunch of different, a whole bunch of companies all throughout are using yeah, yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, Cool. Because what they, they, they recognized is state is the enemy. Mm. And they just want a pattern to lift it up. Got it. And they've just chosen the reactive extensions because that's right now, that's the best that we have for handling this issue for state. And reactive UI and reactive extensions now have been around for nine-ish years. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of nice and stable at this point, Correct. ready to go. So where can people go to learn about this at this point? So to learn about this, I recommend going to the reactive UI website. I've been putting a lot of effort into the documentation. There's a lot more that can be done. Um, I'm working on having interactive examples running in the browser. Oh, cool. So that's going to be really cool. But if you want to learn more about how observables work, um, previous guest that was on the Xamarin show was Michael Stonis. Yeah, I'll link to the, the episode below as well. Yeah, thank you. And it's, it's a beautiful explanation of how it all works. And everything's open source on GitHub, all that jazz that yeah. we would expect, essentially. <laughs> yeah, so Reactive UI itself is uh, it's part of the .NET Foundation. Oh, cool. It's open source on GitHub. Awesome. Um, uh, we have our own uh, Slack channel. Um, and we welcome everyone to come join. Yeah. Um, one of the other maintainers, uh, Kent, is currently working on a book for Reactive UI. Oh, cool. And I'd like to show you some of the examples. Sure, yeah, we have a, a minute or two left, so let's, let's take a look real quick. This is kind of like an interactive book here? Yeah, so this is an interactive book. So with, with the book that's been made, it's actually a physical book, oh, cool. but it also has code samples ah, that go with it. Got it. So he's created a WPF-based application. Mm -hmm. Because we're talking about view models here. View models are meant to be platform agnostic. Mm -hmm. And what we have is a, just a simple username and password field. And this has some business logic in it saying the login button is disabled when the username and password is blank. Mm -hmm. Sounds right? looks pretty familiar. Very, yeah. familiar, very, very familiar. Yeah. And likewise, it also has business logic saying the cancel button is uh, disabled when the login button is uh, not executing or not, not, not enabled. So I'm going to fill in some details here, and I'll show you the code behind it. Oh, cool. And it's just a kind of a recap and a live feel of, of just, it's really, really efficient. And because the computer itself knows what its job is, 
and it's doing itself automatically. It's not me doing key up, key down, and hooking event handlers to cause the loop to pump. Okay. It's all automatic. Cool, let's take a look. All right, so as soon as I put a uh, password in, the login button became enabled automatically. And likewise, I click on login, cancels automatic. And some n and, and, fails, a pop -up. and pop up. Yep. So let's look at the code behind this. All right, so on line 24, what we've got is the business logic for can log in. Mm. And what happens is normally you would put this business logic in the I command. Yeah. Instead, what we've got it, it's just like the is busy we, we talked about previously, is as the business logic grows, you just keep adding when any values to okay. that, and it's defined in a single place. So we take the you can log in, and that's consumed by the login command. And that's down on line 34. Mm. And what that does is the, the reactive command is, is consuming the, the observable. And any time that turns between true and false, because what it's doing with true and false is evaluating whether it's string or null or white space. Sure. So every time, the, uh, every time these properties change via a data binding, mm. it will automatically okay. evaluate this. Got it. So no need to try to re-do yeah. it yourself. It's just going to do it. And then also at the same time, can login is reusable. So you can reuse this in multiple Correct. areas of your, your, of your business logic. Within your view model. And your, your, view model yeah. and your business logic. Cool. And uh, so we consume this, and the, the button turns on and off perfectly. It's That's perfectly cool. efficient. And likewise, for the cancel command, I can actually take the whether the login button is executing or not and mm. use that as business logic for whether the button can be enabled or disabled. Got it. That makes sense. Very yeah. cool. I like that. It's nice. Here's like here's a little bit of sample. Here's what you're looking to learn, and then here's exactly what it is, but not this huge, crazy project. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Yeah. So. Um, Line 31, 32, and 33, these are the operators for the reactive extensions. Mm. This is universal knowledge. Um, pl please go see Michael Stonis's talk. Yeah, I'll and link And there's it, yeah. plenty, of, uh, plenty of content out there. Awesome. Jeffrey, this is great. Uh, I'll put all the links to everything that you showed uh, in the show notes below, including that video. Uh, and thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. James, thank you very much yes. for having me. Yeah, try to make me a believer. We'll see how much code turns reactive for me uh, in the next few months. So thanks again for coming out, and thanks for everyone for watching. This has been yet another episode of The Xamarin Show. I'm James Montemagno. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that bell down there. Subscribe over there. You know what to do. Make sure you get those updates each and every week right in your inbox. Until next time, this has been another Xamarin Show. Thanks for watching. Adios.